So welcome uh, everybody, not too many people here, but uh, anyway, uh, welcome to a special session about Life Popat project. Uh, we start with a short uh, one minute video, which uh, shows, shows you uh, the major things in our project, and then we will continue with the talks. So oh, thank you, and now we start with uh, my presentation. Uh, so uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Miroslav Chernik from Technical University of Liberec. I'm principal investigator of this uh, Life Pop project. My colleague Jan Niemeczek is also from uh, our university. So and the whole session will be done uh, by uh, my colleagues. Uh, uh, this is about the project. The uh, project is uh, called Life Popwat, and the title is Innovative Technology Based on Constructed Wetland for Treatment of Pesticide Contaminated Waters. The project ran four years. This is the last year of the project, and the beneficiaries are, besides our university, Center Mining Institute GIG from Poland, and City of Javorno from Poland, then Arus University. A Serpol company from France, Diamo State company in Czech, and Photon Water as a private company from, from the Czech Republic. The, this morning session will have uh, eight uh, presentations. After me, there will be experience from adaptation and operation of the system by Jan Niemeczek, then about uh, benthic diatoms in the wetland system by Martina, plants in the wetland system by Carlos, uh, a practical lessons of difficulties in construction on the site in Poland will be by Beata. Then HCH indicators via phyto screening by Pavel. I will return back with the social economic impact. And the last presentation will be offered for you as a potential clients to do the replication of the technology on, a, on your site by Antoine. And of course, uh, we have also time for discussion. So as I said, uh, my, my talk will be, will be about the technology itself and uh, this is introduction to, to our technology and to uh, results which we have. And the talk was prepared by me and my colleague Pavel Hrabak and Peter Bruček from Diamo company. The project itself is, uh, as in the name of the project said, it's about constructed wetland for purification of water contaminated by linden like compounds and its uh, transformation products. And we uh, have two sites, two pilot sites where we uh, install this prototype. We also do the monitoring, but not only environmental monitoring, but also social economic monitoring of impact. Then uh, we will speak about the uh, replication of the prototype, which is the, one of the out output of the project. And of course, the dissemination of the project is also an important part that this is the reason that uh, we present also the, the technology here. Uh, the project is about two sites which are on this picture. The first site is in Hayek in the Czech Republic, here, where the waste from the Spolana Neratovice factory, which is, which is more than 100 kilometers away from the site, uh, the waste uh, from this uh, factory was, was dumped there, and the second site is in Javosno in Poland, uh, where is a company uh, Organica Azot. It's close to Katowice, 
and uh, this is the site which is uh, much bigger and there are also some other other type of pesticides not only the linden so the first about the Hayek, this is the picture of how Hayek looked uh, at the end of last year, but we go to the history of the site, which started in the middle of 60s, where they opened the quarry for uranium there in the, in the, on the site, on the meadows. And after a few years, uh, they, they, made a, they made such an open pit. Dump, dump, dump site, and uh, they decided to put here the waste from this Splana Neratovice, something between 3,000 to 5,000 tons of HCH uh, byproducts, which are stored somewhere in the in the region which are located here. Nobody knows. They put it there, drums, paper, paper bags, and uh, such such unstable unstable packaging there, and this is the source of contamination now. At the end of 90s, the recultivation started. The, the upper part is uh, changed to some, to some lakes, and the down is uh, sort of uh, also stabilized. So this is the picture how it looked uh, uh, before we, we came and we, we start to, to make the wetland system there. And if you look here, this is red, red spot is the area where the uh, drain water is collected and goes in the direction, direction of, the, of the flow. And this is uh, again the same picture where the contaminated uh, site is in the middle. You see, you see the creek which goes to nature uh, 2000 area. Then we have some hunting reserve very close to the site. And on the other side, we have the relaxation zone. So there are some, some uh, things which, of course, don't, uh, doesn't want to, have, uh, to be contaminated. Uh, but the, the, the water coming from the site is contaminated, coming to the lakes and, and the rivers. The technology is based on four steps. The protein water, which is here, first come to aerobic sedimentary tank. Uh, the reason of this tank is that the water contains about 20 milligrams of dissolved iron and we wanted to reduce this concentration by uh, oxidation and by clogging of the iron oxides. This, this part doesn't work properly, but my colleague will, will tell more. The first reactive step is permeable reactive barrier filled with iron chips where the uh, HCH compounds are partially disintegrated. Then we have the biosorption uh, unit with the wood chips. And then we have uh, aerobic uh, wetland where we have different type of, of uh, wetland, uh, wetland plants. And this is the final treatment and cleaning the water. Uh, this is how the prototype looked uh, at the end of the construction before the operation started, which was somehow middle of the 2021. And this is how it looked one year after, so that all the, the plants are grown and uh, the, all the system is in operation. You will get later from Jan detailed about uh, performance, about the indicators. So these are some, again, some picture how the, how the site changed within one year, how the, how the plants grow up. And again, some, some details, picture, Martina will tell you more about different type of plants and Carlos as well. Uh, one last picture about the site is, is here, where on the left side you have the initial water coming to the system, which contains around 160 uh, micrograms of the, of the uh, HCH compounds in liter. And during the, during the system, there are different steps, A, B, C, and D. Uh, the, the water is uh, cleaned, and the most important is D, which is outflow from the system. And you see that after some tuning of, of the system, we are able to reduce it from this 160 to about 8 micrograms uh, in liter. And uh, we hope that it's, this value will, will decrease later on. The second site is Javotno in Poland. Unfortunately, this is in the middle of, of the city Javotno. And uh, there is a similar picture like for, for Hayek. 
the source is is, is here. This is the factory organic azote. And you see that there are also some very near residential area where you feel the, the smell, smell of the, of the contamination. Then you have two, two, two plumes, one going to the west, one going to the east. And there is also some, some commercial shellfish picking area so that, again, this is the contamination which is in, the, in, the, in this case in the middle of the city which some, uh, some activities around. Yeah, uh, so the system is much smaller than this is the experimental part. Uh, the system in, is Hayek. In Hayek was uh, constructed for three liters per second. Here is 4.1 liter per second. This is based on some, on some containers which are on the picture here. This is just a picture before we start the operation. And my colleagues will tell you more about, about the system. Thank you. Thank you, for, uh, Miroslav, for, for the introduction of the project. And I will talk about the experience of the operation of the, of the first prototype that is uh, being operated for uh, more than a year in, in Hayek in the Czech Republic. First, I would like to uh, introduce uh, my colleagues that participate uh, in this part of the project. It's uh, Miroslav, uh, Pavel Hrabák, and Teresa Sazaska from the Technical University of Liberec, then Josef Zevan uh, from the Masaryk University, Petr Brujek from the DMO uh, State Enterprise in the Czech Republic, and Petr Kvapil and Wojciech Antoš from Photon Water Technology. Uh, I will just quickly refresh the information already given uh, by Miroslav on, on the prototype uh, in Hayek. Uh, it consists of uh, four uh, segments. The first segment A is here and uh, uh, it is for designed for removal of, of iron. So uh, aeration and sedimentation of iron precipitates take place there. Then there's a core part of the technology. It's uh, segment B. Uh, these are modules filled with uh, zero valent iron and this module should be responsible for removal of the uh, major part of uh, the HCH contamination. Uh, then there are segments C uh, connected uh, in parallel uh, biosorption segments and then there is a large uh, final uh, segment D, which is aerobic wetland for the final treatment of uh, mostly intermediates of uh, HCH degradation. Uh, this is the layout of the system that was operated uh, during first nine months of, uh, uh, of, of the operation. Uh, the, the flow is from left to right, so the opposite uh, to the previous picture. So A, and then in parallel there are two uh, streams, left and right streams. B1, B2, B5, B6 are uh, modules uh, with uh, zero uh, warrant iron, and then two segments, uh, C and final aerobic wetland. And this is uh, the ACH removal efficiency of the system during uh, first four or sorry, five months of the operation. And uh, we observed uh, the descending trend of the efficiency from the initial 97% down to uh, approximately 50, 54%. So uh, here's the, the flow rate through the system. And we could see that maybe that the last decline is due to higher flow rate through the system. But the initial, the initial uh, three months, uh, the flow rate was the stable, but anyway, the, the efficiency declined. So we were facing some problem. We looked to the efficiency of individual segments of the system 
and we found relatively low removal efficiency of uh, segments B, which should be the, the core of uh, the technology with regards to removal of HCH. You can see relatively low removal efficiency, not exceeding 20%. So we looked uh, to these segments in a more detail. Uh, we looked to not only to uh, physical parameters, but also to inorganic uh, content of, of individual ions and, and uh, make some uh, so computations, uh, geo chemical modeling and found that uh, there are uh, that the, the whole uh, segment B is in uh, aerobic rather than uh, anoxic uh, conditions and it has two consequences first uh, the water is oversaturated uh, with regards to ferric hydroxide and ferric uh, oxyhydroxide and um, these precipitates uh, clock, uh, clock the fill with iron and deactivated it. Furthermore, uh, aerobic corrosion does not produce uh, molecular hydrogen that is uh, very important for removal of or degradation of HCH as it is very strong reducing agent. So we need to keep the segment B in anoxic conditions to promote anoxic corrosion of iron rather than to, to have it in aerobic state. Uh, so we made some changes, some modification of the system. Uh, we left uh, we left the left stream in an original setup and we made some changes uh, in the right stream. We bypassed the segment A, so the water is not aerated anymore and uh, content contain uh, very low concentration of dissolved oxygen. And we made also some changes in B5 and B6 segments. You could see these changes on this uh, uh, this picture on the left side. There is the original setup of, of these modules. You could see that uh, the water flew over the mostly over the layer of the of the zero valor iron fill rather than through and uh, the atmospheric oxygen could diffuse into this water water layer so it then resulted in aerobic conditions with relatively high content of uh, dissolved oxygen in water so we made these changes we put a pvc foil on the top of the uh, of the water layer it's floating pvc foil and we installed uh, partitions to force the water to flow to flow through the the zero iron fill. Here's the picture. You could see uh, the the foil installed on on the water on the water layer, and we also made some. Uh, modifications with regards to uh, flow system. The water uh, does not flow over over this berm anymore and is drained through the bottom part of the mm -hmm, of, of, of the basin in order to keep it in an anoxic state. And <clears throat> Here's the result uh, in terms of concentration of total iron, which is the blue line, uh, dissolved iron, which is the red line, and colloid iron, which is the gray line. On the left side, it is 
the flow through the unmodified part of uh, the installation and the right graph is uh, the concentration uh, during the flow through the modified portion of the system and you could see very dramatic change the colloid iron which is unwanted type of the iron is much higher in unmodified part of the installation in comparison to modified and we have in modified section much much higher concentration of uh, dissolved iron so ferrous type of the iron which is the which is the evidence of uh, much intensive reaction of water with the with the fill with the zero iron iron fill of uh, b5 and b6 modules uh, it also resulted in much lower redox potential and higher ph due to these reactions so in red you can see positions uh, of uh, water in treated or in modified b5 b6 uh, modules in comparison to unmodified b1 and b2 and uh, the most important consequence was uh, increase in uh, efficiency from this 40, uh, sorry, 54 percent up to 90, 97. And uh, you could see also the, the flow rate that descended during the summer period. You could see that in modified sections B5 and B6, uh, the efficiency dramatically increased up to 65 percent and uh, overall uh, removal efficiency uh, was this 97-95% on the right side. Uh, the removal efficiency of individual isomers are not uniform. We can see that removal efficiency of uh, alpha, gamma and delta isomer is much higher than beta and epsilon isomers. Unfortunately, uh, beta and epsilon isomers are not uh, present in large amounts in the inlet water. So the, the overall uh, removal efficiency of HCH is, is still high. Uh, and these uh, this uh, ununiform removal efficiency of individual isomers uh, results in change of uh, relative content of individual isomers uh, passing the during the during the treatment in the in the wetland system. So uh, at the inlet. Delta isomer dominates and covers 79% of the total content of uh, HCH and at the outlet, epsilon is dominating. This is removal efficiency in, segment, in segments B, so passing the, the modules with the iron fill. And uh, in blue, it's a removal of in unmodified flow flow pathway or flow stream and in red it is removal in uh, modified so you could see that the removal efficiency increased almost by by 100 uh, percent these are half-lives calculated for individual isomers in segments B, you could see that the half-life varies in the range of first units of, of, of days. And again, 
uh, it follows uh, it follows uh, the similar pattern as uh, uh, the removal efficiency. So alpha and gamma have much shorter half lives th uh, than the rest of isomers. And we looked also for uh, intermediates of degradation. Uh, here, the uh, possible pathways of linden dechlorination uh, by silver and iron is presented by Wang. And uh, <coughs> you can see that the, the final uh, products of um, this uh, inorganic degradation uh, of, of lindane uh, are benzene and monochlor benzene. So we looked for these constituents uh, in individual uh, segments of the system. And again, we uh, comparatively displayed uh, the, uh, the concentration of these constituents, benzene and monochlor benzene, uh, in unmodified and modified parts of the system. And we can see that in modified system, uh, there is a very significant increase of these intermediates uh, in comparison to the unmodified uh, sections. Uh, here is the total mass of uh, eliminated pollutants. Uh, uh, during the first uh, 15 months of the operation, we could see that uh, we removed uh, more than 16 kilograms of uh, chlorobenzenes, which are also present, and uh, uh, the removal efficiency of, of uh, these compounds is more than 98%. Uh, we removed uh, almost four kilograms of HCH, and also uh, some amount of uh, chlorophenols that are also present in, in, the, in the system. So what is the summary? Uh, the modification of the wetland uh, led to uh, rather high uh, HCH removal, up to 95% to date. There is various removal efficiency for individual HCH isomers, uh, where alpha, gamma, and delta uh, represent uh, the highest removal rates, and beta and epsilon have much uh, lower removal rates. It means that uh, uh, delta dominates at the inlet, and epsilon dominates that at the outlet of the system. I uh, forgot to present the, uh, the picture on the, with the graph of the mass discharge to the Ostrowski Creek. We also calculated the mass discharge to the, to the recipient that uh, uh, it is the Ostrowski Creek that feeds the, the lakes that were shown to uh, Miroslav. Uh, the lakes uh, are used for uh, carpish, uh, car uh, fish breeding, so it is very sensitive recipient of the contamination. Uh, and the distance between uh, the, the, the dump and uh, these lakes is less than one kilometer. So the residence time is a uh, few hours. And we decreased this mass discharge into this surface water ecosystem from 23 up to 25 grams per day before the installation down to 0 0.8, 0 0.9 grams per day. So it is approximately 97% decrease of uh, the HCH mass discharge. And here's the information about the amount of uh, removed main contaminants, 3.8 kilograms HCH, 16 kilograms of removed chlorobenzenes, and half kilogram of removed chlorobenzenes. 
Now we work on, on uh, another modifications to, to sustain the, the, the efficiency of technology. We still plan some, some changes and we want to uh, modify the existing modules B1 and B2 in order to uh, increase the overall efficiency and, and to sustain it. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Jan, for the chemistry. I think it was too, too, too much chemistry for you. So now we switch to biology. We have uh, next two talks about the biology. The first, uh, Martina Stroisova, we start with the phyto, phyto, phytobentic uh, microbes. Yeah. So my name is Martina Stroisova, and I'm from the Technical University in Liberec. Uh, and my presentation uh, deals with the use of benthic diatoms as, bio in, uh, as bioindicators uh, of environmental impact of wetland technology. As you heard before, uh, the uh, wetland prototype uh, uh, treat, treats uh, the water contaminated with, with uh, HCH uh, and uh, the long uh, uh, the long monitor monitoring of uh, the uh, of the changes uh, of diatom uh, of diatoms uh, uh, can uh, uh, can be used as indicators of the environmental impact of wetland uh, plus system on the water environment. Uh, the use of uh, uh, diatoms as uh, indicators uh, is very common uh, and uh, also uh, European uh, Union uh, uh, the state uh, the, ecolog the ecological state of rivers uh, in the European Union is also uh, uh, done or evalu evaluated in addition to other bioindicators uh, by using benthic diatoms. Uh, so first, uh, let me introduce the uh, let me introduce diatoms because maybe uh, there is somebody who doesn't know what they are. So uh, I will st I will start with the definition of uh, phytobentos. Uh, phytobentos uh, they are uh, macroscopic and uh, microscopic algae uh, that live attached. Uh, in, uh, to submerge uh, uh, various submerged uh, objects uh, such as stones, branches, uh, plants, uh, and uh, the major group of uh, phytobentos are benthic uh, diatoms. Uh, they are uh, uh, microscopic unicellular uh, algae. Uh, which are uh, very common in all types of water bodies and also in the, in the soil. And uh, they are very sensitive to environmental fa uh, factors such as light, pH, uh, amount of uh, nutrition and uh, 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 organic matter in the water and also uh, uh, their predators and competitors uh, in the um, system. And that's why uh, uh, the diatom uh, can be very good uh, bioindicator, uh, bioindicators of changes of environmental condition. Uh, so while evaluation uh, of water quality uh, using uh, phyto, uh, physiochemical examination uh, detects water quality only uh, at the time of sampling, uh, phytobentos analysis can uh, evaluate it water quality in the longer term. So uh, it is suitable uh, or it is good addition to chemical uh, uh, examination uh, to uh, have a look to uh, diatoms. So, uh, 
on this map, does it work? No. 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 So, as you can see before, the, uh, uh, my colleagues in, introduce, introduce uh, locality. Uh, there is the Greek, and there uh, were four profiles uh, for sampling uh, diatoms. The profiles was the same as uh, for the uh, chemical analysis. And uh, the reference Greek, uh, it's the uh, tributary here. A small, small Greek, uh, 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 which inflows to the Ostrovsky Greek, it was chosen as a, a reference, uh, a reference uh, 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 point uh, or profile. Uh, the four uh, profiles on Ostrovsky Greek uh, were sampled uh, in uh, year uh, 2021 and uh, also in 2022. Uh, and the reference Greek was uh, sampled only in uh, 21 because last year uh, was uh, mm, it was no water in, in it, it was dry. Uh, and uh, uh, there were nine uh, sampled uh, sites uh, in uh, Wetland Plus. So, uh, diatom, sam diatom samples were collected uh, from uh, submerged uh, objects, uh, uh, mainly from uh, stones, uh, by brushing uh, of the objects. And the determination of uh, the diatom species uh, was done uh, by light microscopy, uh, and uh, of, by using standard European methods. And uh, the relative abundance of uh, diatom uh, was evaluated by, uh, count, uh, uh, by counting uh, each cells, diatom cell, diatom cell. Uh, also, uh, di uh, the diversity of diatom community, uh, community was evalu evaluated and the Shannon Diversity Index uh, was, was used. Uh, uh, this index uh, uh, they, uh, take uh, this index ref uh, refer, ref refers to uh, a uh, number of diatoms, a species, diatom species, and also their abundance in, this, in, in each sample. So uh, uh, the uh, Shannon Diversity Index is uh, larger, uh, and so uh, biodiversity is better when the uh, val and when its uh, value is higher. So. Yeah. Uh, in on this uh, picture, you can, you can see um, some uh, species of diatoms, uh, li uh, living diatoms, uh, you know, in the live in the live sample. So there are some uh, results. Uh, uh, there are four profiles on the Ostrovsky Creek, and uh, you can see here. The, spe sorry. The, spe uh, the number of uh, species in each uh, points and uh, also in a reference creek and uh, the uh, number of uh, species uh, uh, were from zero uh, in uh, point in, uh, in uh, point one. Uh, to uh, 35 in uh, uh, site uh, four here. And the value of uh, uh, diversity 
uh, which, which is uh, marked as H here, uh, ranges, ranges from uh, mm, 1.04 to 4.072. And as you can see uh, in uh, mm, point one, there is uh, no uh, species, so the biodiversity is also the worst. The worst. And uh, you, can, you can see the trend of uh, uh, the uh, No, the, the, um, the numbers of species uh, um, rise from the beginning uh, of the Greek to the, to the end, uh, as you can see uh, in uh, year uh, 2021, so before the uh, wetland technology was started. So from zero, uh, zero, three, uh, 30, uh, 0, 3, 30, and 35, and there were 28 species in reference Greek. And it's very uh, close, reference Greek, uh, the uh, sam sampling point in reference Greek is very close to uh, the uh, um, to, uh, uh, site two on uh, Ostrovsky Creek, and there were only three species, and very close uh, to the Ostrovsky Greek, Greek uh, there were 28 species. So uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, the, the numbers are different, uh, the different number. And also diversity uh, rise from the beginning where, where uh, is the highest, no, where was, where was the highest HCH concentration uh, due to uh, dilution and also processes in the water. And uh, last, last year, uh, there, wo there were more species of rotifers in uh, point uh, one and two. Uh, the, uh, the numbers uh, of species were uh, higher than uh, uh, the uh, was higher after the uh, wetland technology was started than uh, one year before. Uh, but uh, or while uh, in point in points three of sites three and four. Uh, the numbers of species were similar in uh, both years before and after uh, start, start of uh, wetland technology. <laughs> so, and on this picture, you can see the, the, the same, but uh, on the uh, there are uh, numbers uh, of uh, rotifer uh, of uh, diatom species and di uh, and it, uh, and their uh, biodiversity uh, in uh, wetland. Uh, overall, uh, there there were found uh, 33 species of diatoms uh, in last last August in this uh, in this uh, wetland system. And uh, there was only uh, no, there yeah, there was only one species uh, here in uh, in section A, where is the highest concentration of uh, HCH, and also a very small species, only one, was found in uh, section C, and the highest numbers of uh, uh, species was found in section D. Uh, three species uh, at the beginning uh, of the section and 18 and 16 species at the end, uh, at the end of the uh, D section. Uh, uh, sim uh, this uh, species of diatom, uh, Cymbella lange betaloty, was the only species uh, which was found in uh, 
uh, section A and C with the highest pollution. And on the left uh, uh, pictures, you can, you can see the uh, cell uh, without organic matters. And on the right side, uh, they, there are uh, living diat diatoms. And this, this species, uh, Cimbela, was, was uh, observed in all investigated uh, sites, uh, except uh, of profile four on Ostrovsky Greek. Um, overall, three, uh, 32 species uh, were uh, observed uh, in wetland D, uh, wetland section D, uh, last August, uh, and you can see some uh, uh, species, uh, two species, uh, two, uh, two uh, species of Stauronais, very uh, Ropalodia, and uh, two species uh, of Epithemia, and there were a uh, uh, lot of more rotifers. Uh, sorry, diatom. <laughs> diatoms, uh, and uh, 64 species were found uh, uh, in uh, all uh, sites uh, sampled uh, in uh, Ostrovsky Creek uh, last, last year in August uh, 22. There are some of, uh, some of them, and this is uh, not uh, uh, diatom, but uh, this is uh, Leptotrix ochracea. Uh, it's a bacterium uh, which, uh, uh, which was very common uh, in all uh, samples with high iron precipitates. So, uh, only uh, I, I will uh, read uh, conclusions. Uh, so, each benthic sample contained from 0 to 35 species uh, and values of the uh, Shannon diversity index range from 0 to 4.72. And before wetland was put into operation, uh, the results showed an increasing trend of the number of uh, species uh, identif identified in profiles along the Ostrovsky Greek. So, uh, this uh, results uh, fit, uh, fit well with the decreasing trend of HCH uh, concentration in surface uh, water due to dil dilution and attenuation processes. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we notice changes in the composition uh, of the diatom community. Uh, and in, uh, also in uh, cell density before and after the uh, start of uh, Wetland Plus. Uh, after one year of running of Wetland Plus, uh, a significantly greater uh, number of diatom species were, were observed in profile one and two uh, on Ostrovsky Creek, while the numbers of diatom species in profiles three and four were similar before and after the start of uh, wetland technology. Uh, so uh, we can con conclu um, conclude that long-term monitoring in the changes of composition of diatom communities seems, seems, to, be a uh, sweet, uh, seems to be a good uh, indicator of the impact of uh, wetland on the water ecosystem. So, thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you, thank, thank you, Martin. I will see that we do the right things, that uh, the biodiversity increase in the system, and we hope it will increase uh, more in uh, next years. So, we now shift from the very small organisms to the bigger one, to normal plants, and Carlos will present, yeah, you will present something. I don't know if you will speak Czech, uh, Czech or Spanish or, or <laughs> English. <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much for coming. I think I'll present in Danish now. <laughs> okay. No, can I? Okay. Actually, uh, we are hardcore engineers, right? We like uh, technology, but 
but I think I'm going to focus a little bit on, on, on plants, right? We don't give so much credit to the plants, their role and, and what they can do. And uh, well, this is work that has been done by a whole bunch of people, right? This is not uh, my work. This is actually work mostly from our PhDs and, and our team, both in Liberec and in, in Denmark. So wetlands, we all know wetlands, they are uh, reactors that have huge productivity uh, because of the conditions what they have. They have water, they have sun, they have light, and they have nutrients, right? So actually, so we can, we can say that these natural systems, uh, it's, it's just an, a reactor that has many possibilities. So, but what is a, what is a treatment wetland? Actually, it's, it's a natural system that uh, harnesses natural processes to, to uh, improve water quality. And when I say water quality, it's been traditionally used for domestic waters, but actually the potential is huge. And uh, we have seen before that, that they have great potential for removing this HCH. So we have a, they have to be technical design and uh, they have really complex uh, uh, interactions between water, soil, plants, microorganisms, and, and the atmosphere. So, but what, what is the difference? I mean, we have these plants that are uh, able to survive under these this, uh, harsh conditions, redox potentials that are very low. But if, if we have a regular plant, I mean, I have an image of, of uh, mice, and then when it's flooded, so there's going to be all these processes that are going to make sure the, the plant is gonna die. They will not survive because there's no mitosis, there's very low production of ATP. There's going to be ethanol accumulation that is going to actually poison the plant. And of course, uh, post anoxia metabolites and, and lots of radicals that at the end is going to be, uh, you know, poisonous for the plant. Also, if we have a flooded system, the, this diffusion of oxygen, it's very limited and it's not, it's not going to happen. So plants are adapted. This doesn't work. Uh, so we uh, have different plants and they, they, they take over according to depth. There are some that are very capable of surviving in deeper or uh, close to, to, to the surface. But why is that? So the, some of the important processes is growth of biomass, photosynthesis, nutrient uptake, water uptake, oxygen transport, metabolism, and food chain support. I'm going to focus on these first ones, food chain support. We don't want so much uh, food chain in, in, in this type of uh, HCH uh, project that we have right now. So biomass, they can accumulate a lot of carbon. They are a typical wetland plant. They vary according to the species. But if I take Phragmitis, which is one of the most common ones, it's, it's, a, it's a plant that you, we find uh, everywhere. And uh, we, get, we get about 8,000 kilograms of carbon of, uh, of uh, carbon per hectare per year. And of course, this, this biomass is not only on the, on the area part, but also on the, uh, the rooted part. Photosynthesis, well, we all know what photosynthesis is. We want to take CO2 from the atmosphere. We're going to produce uh, oxygen, so that's going to help our aerobic processes. And it happens for these uh, surface plants like Phragmites, or it also happens for the submerged ones. Uh, one interesting thing is that these plants are able to oxygenate the, the water table. So uh, actually, uh, these plants, well, I can go later on that. They also uh, are useful for nutrient uptake. So we uh, treating polluted waters like uh, domestic weight waters that we have a lot of ammonium, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, they can uptake some, but of course we have to harvest them. But in cases like, like the ones we have in, in, in our project in Life for What, we don't have a lot of nutrients. So uh, this is a very sustainable uh, process because we just get PETA creation that can help remove the HCH. Also, there's something that is being talked now, is uh, this transpiration pump. 
we're getting a lot of water, and then uh, because of uh, climatic conditions, the plants are able to evapotranspire this this uh, this water. They actually some systems that are able to evapotranspire all the water that is produced. The uh, evapotranspirative systems we're not using them in HCH, but uh, you find about five thousand of these systems in Denmark. So. But one of the uh, most important uh, phenomena or processes that happen is the oxygen release from the roots. Uh, these plants are able to take air from the atmosphere, transfer it to the roots, and release it. Here, what, what we see is a very simple experiment where we get a, a gel with a blue methylene. We remove all the oxygen, and then we, we set up a plant. And after a while, all these, these halos, these uh, blue, blue parts, it's uh, showing that there is oxygen transport. So, and this happens because we have this tissue, which is our enchema. And um, of course, Phragmitis, Carex, and all these uh, uh, wetland plants, they have it, and they are able to transport all the oxygen to the root section. If we compare wetland plants, like Phragmitis, Typha, Glyceria, uh, many of these, of course, and Phalaris, to terrestrial plants, we find that uh, they, can, they can have uh, this uh, root porosity is about 20%, while the terrestrial plants, they, they don't even reach uh, five, 7%. So this is what makes these plants survive. And this is what we're taking advantage of when we're using our wetlands in, in treating polluted waters, including the HCH. Of course, it's not only the transport, but also this consortia of bacteria. If we have uh, these plants, like uh, we saw in, in the previous pictures, this will give us a huge surface for bacteria uh, consortia to attach that would speed up processes and make uh, processes more effective. Some of the images that I'm showing uh, from, from our experience that we have taken some, some and, uh, yeah, uh, micro uh, images to show that, that we have not only one type of bacteria, but several bacteria that can, that can uh, survive and, and, and do these this, uh, removal processes. We also know, and this we are actually in the HCH project in Lab for What, this is what we uh, based the, the use of plants, because they can, they can uptake and degrade, metabolize uh, pollutants. This is some of the uh, work that we've done in, in, uh, with micropollutants, and we have taken about 70, 80 of them, and then we have shown that they're able to metabolize and remove. Actually, the translocation is in the range of 10 uh, to 15% of these uh, pollutants. And now what we're doing is looking at the HCH. Uh, actually, two of the PhDs are work, doing this work, and I'm gonna show some results in a minute, to try to uh, assess how much we or oh, these plants are able to, to remove. So actually what we have is, is a, a whole bunch of, of processes uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, the plants themselves that are able to, to uh, metabolize in the different organs of the plant. And, uh, and if we look at, for instance, this, this is something we've done with ibuprofen, where we have different types of species. And of course, this is to show that uh, the removal can be species dependent. It's not uh, 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 all the plants that do not perform the same, they're, they're going to be uh, species dependent. So once say that, this is how the, the system looked last year. And, uh, we have taken upon ourselves to do a, a test with, uh, where we had 60, 60 plants and we had about a, a four, four different plants, Juncus, Typha, Phragmitis, Alnus, all of them that are being planted in, in our wetlands. And of course we had blanks with no plants. We spiked these uh, pots with solution with the, the, uh, different concentrations and we're looking at uh, the Delta and technical HCH. Uh, we're also looking at the chemical removal, but we're also looking at the uh, microbial communities, 
I'm not going to present this, this research, the results from the, from the my coworker community is, is going to be in, in an article at the same with, with this one that I'm going to present now. So the study was performed. Uh, first, the plants were acclimated in a regular greenhouse. After all the plants were moved to a site where we have a growth chamber under control conditions, we had light, humidity, uh, and, and temperature. They were going in about 20, 25 degrees, uh, about 16, 8 uh, ratio between light and uh, humidity about 80%. So we did a chemical analysis, but we also did some physiological uh, analysis, infrared uh, gas analyzer to, to evaluate the health of the plants. And uh, uh, yes, and this was, uh, this experiment ran for about uh, a month or so. Important here, and this is, this is I think this is uh, one of the main messages, if if we look at uh, the results, just so this, I think this this justifies the use of plants in 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 our uh, system. So that means that is not only a chemical process, but we can improve the performance just by having plants that can help us. They can boost the 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 processes. And uh, well, uh, there is plenty of work that has to be done. We continue uh, striving to find uh, proper balances to uh, even optimize in the selection of plants that we want to use. So just just to to finish up, uh, we know that the unplanted uh, controls decrease by, by when we removal, sorry, I'm saying the removal efficiency decrease as we increase the, uh, the HCH concentrations. Uh, the presence of plants, of course, imp increase the removal, and we have a order uh, saying that alder was better than juncus, better than typha, and then phragmitis was the least efficient. But even though it was the less, least uh, efficient, it was much higher than the unplanted systems. Uh, all the plants uh, show better uh, phyto, phyto extractability, and uh, the effect of the conditions is excluded, but uh, it ha does have a, a positive effect, and uh, this is worked in a, in a different article. So we have some, some results from, from uh, Delta LCH. Oh, sorry. So, so uh, we only had a delta HCH, but they were recorded in the plant biomass in very low concentrations. And uh, the AG, high concentration of the pesticides in the trunks, this is for Alta, was very low and, uh, in the leaves, especially in the groups for uh, high concentrations. This uh, relates with the uh, different levels uh, for the levels uh, one, three, the ICLB, where the trunk, uh, the AG in the trunks was the highest. For the technical ACH, there is no significant the differences in the removal, and the concentrations in biomass are generally lower than the delta, but this is actually expected. So thank you for your attention. If there's any questions. Thank you, Carlos. Now, now we know why the, the plants in wetland are so important for the removal of uh, contaminants. At the beginning, I, I said that we have two sites, and uh, till now we concentrated to high site, and now Beata will explain why the, the second site is, uh, is difficult now in uh, what, what the problem they solved during the construction. Yeah. 
Uh, good morning. Let's start uh, me by introducing me and my colleagues uh, Grzegorz Gzel. Uh, together we are working in the Central Mining Institute and we are engaged in live PopVAT project uh, concerning problems of HCH contamination. Um, the topic of my presentation you can he hear on, on the slide is very long, so I shortly tell you that I would like you to present some information about practical lesson taken from the uh, construction period of uh, wetland uh, plus uh, pilot uh, plant in uh, Jaworzno. Mm. Firstly, uh, I'd like to brief, briefly refer you about the problem of Jaworzno. Uh, Jaworzno is the small city located in the south of Poland uh, where the chemical plant Organica Azot uh, produced lindane from 1965 till 1982. Uh, this uh, chemical plant was built uh, as an activity of uh, Polish president Ignacy Mościński in 1917. And and uh, in 1928, start uh, produce a wide range of um, chemical products, uh, inorganic, organic uh, chemicals, uh, as well as uh, plant protection pro uh, products. In uh, 1965, starts producing uh, lindane and ends in 1982. And uh, in uh, then they observe a lot of problems with wastes and uh, wastewater and they decide to build a wastewater treatment plant in 1983. Uh, it is based uh, on uh, activated carbon, so the process is based on filtration and chemical oxidation of contamination. And in 19, it could be observed a lot of financial problems uh, of company uh, due to the ban of uh, DDT production and HCH production. So now um, it could be observed a significant, significant reduction uh, of um, production level of chemicals by this chemical plant, um, some more financial problems. So um, the truth is uh, that uh, wastewater treatment plant now uh, is um, um, threatens the operation of this wastewater uh, treatment plant. So the um, current situation threatens uh, to the state of groundwater, of surface water, and also to the health of uh, residents. Um, because as you can see in, in this picture, uh, the chemical plant uh, is located very nearly close to the residential area. It's exactly here. And the contamination plant, marked here in red color, is nearly the residential area. And uh, through the site flows Wąwolnica stream, which uh, take contamination from the from the site. Uh, Wąwolnica stream uh, flows into Przemsza River, and uh, Przemsza River is a tributary to Vistula River, which uh, goes to Baltic Sea. So uh, Jaworzno site is known as a hot spot for Baltic uh, Sea uh, water. And uh, in the previous uh, years, Central Mining Institute, together with uh, City of Jaworzno and other partners, um, for example, uh, from Technical University in Liberec, uh, tried to recognize and find key sources uh, of contamination. As, as you can see in this picture, uh, the main um, contaminated uh, site is located here. Central landfill in uh, Rudna Gura, which is filled with uh, 200,000 tons of uh, HCH uh, wastes. We also recognize other uh, contamination uh, landfill like, like field A, B, and K, which are filled mainly with uh, mining and uh, municipal waste, but also uh, they, this. Um, the field are filled with uh, cyanides, uh, which was uh, produced also by chemical plant um, Organica Azot. And uh, we uh, discovered uh, two plums of contamination. The one is uh, located on the north uh, bank of Wąwolnica stream. It's exactly here. And 
Here the concentration of HCH is about 10 to 100 micrograms per liter and dominated here beta HCH. That means that uh, in this plume we can uh, observe old contamination. And on the soft, uh, we can observe the much higher concentration of HCH. It's about 300 mi micrograms per uh, liter. We also uh, made uh, some exper experiments with uh, modelings uh, of contaminated uh, water uh, flow, and we as, uh, tried to car carry out um, the uh, risk level for uh, water intake, uh, Jarosław uh, Dombrowski. And uh, now I'd like to tell you uh, more about the um, pilot plant in Yavozno. It will be look. It's it is loca loca located uh, between trench R2 and R3. Uh, it's um, in middle in the network of uh, trenches, which uh, take and contaminated uh, water from field K. sites and uh, this water goes uh, by trench A and B to the pump station and after that to the wastewater treatment plant located uh, uh, at the area of chemical plant Organica Azot. And why we decide to locate our installation here? Because uh, you can see that the concentration level uh, in water in, in these trenches is much um, different in each of, of them. For example, in trench R2, we only got one microgram per liter of, uh, of HCH concentration. In uh, trench R3, the concentration is about 80 micrograms per liter. So we can take these two types of water, mix together and um, try to uh, find the best uh, concentration for, for treat uh, by our system. Uh, here is the original design of uh, wetland um, pilot system in Yavozno. So consists of uh, of wells, uh, as I as, as I said before, two wells, one which uh, take um, low concentrated uh, water and another one with high concentration of HCH. Then we've got mixed tank, then we've got compartment uh, for sedimentation and oxidation. After that, um, we've got ZVI module, biosorption module, and aerobic in, in, and inf infiltration uh, wetland. Uh, but during the, the construction of um, of this system, uh, we found a lot of problems. Uh, it was really bad period because uh, in this time, in the um, between August 2021, June 2022, uh, there was a lot, a lot of problems with um, um, construction materials due to the pandemics and due to the war in Ukraine. So the company that uh, construction company couldn't get uh, materials to, to build this system and finish these systems. So we have to retendering and uh, find, uh, finally we found uh, the other construction uh, company which uh, finished our system between November 2022 and December uh, 2022. And uh, it was a good time for us because uh, we've got results from installation and Hayek and we know that um, the problem is with, with, is with iron which pre precipitated uh, after oxidation in the first tank in, in Hayek. So we, we know that and we try to uh, make um, some changes in our um, project uh, before the new company start to finish our installation. So we decide in this moment to use two separate technological lines which help us to optimize our system. Uh, we also decide to put more uh, flow samples and more uh, monitoring um, sampling points. And uh, as I said before, oh, 
sorry, we decide to, to change uh, the first model. Now it's only a sedimentation model. It's uh, totally covered and uh, without um, contact with oxygen to, to avoid precipitation of iron. Then we've got PRB model. That means that this model is uh, filled with uh, micro iron. Uh, it is also a change because in the original design, we was thinking about uh, using um, iron chips that it's uh, possible to get from steel market. But finally, uh, in, in Polish condition, we, we found that it's highly co contaminated by, by oil. So now we are using a professional micro iron in our system. And uh, we put also um, electrodes to the PRB models to enhance electrochemical reduction of, uh, of contamination. Uh, then we've got biosorption model. Here we don't change anything. It's uh, filled with uh, sand and uh, gravel. And we've got also aerobic uh, wetland for uh, final bioremediation and infiltration wetland for uh, reverting um, treated water to the environment and to make high uh, biodiversity. And uh, now it's look uh, like on this uh, picture, uh, it's current land development uh, project and here are the photos from December 2022. And here are the, the new um, photos that present uh, uh, current uh, situation. The installation is finished and we start uh, taking a sample uh, with the beginning of the March if the weather will be in Poland good. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Beata, for uh, describing the problems which we have on the second side. Uh, for, uh, fortunately, the, 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 the problems are over and the, the site starts to running. So the next uh, presentation uh, will be by Pavel Hrabák about the new method of, uh, of uh, monitoring of the HGH compound by phytoscreening. Good morning, everybody. So in my talk, uh, I will try to summarize the work which was performed in past in past eight years approximately in the frame of within the project uh, projects uh, Amiga and uh, Life Pop One. So uh, what uh, in the Carlos excellent presentation, uh, he, ex he explained how wetland plants uh, behave and how they uptake uh, HCH. Uh, but for phytoscreening, the mechanisms are a little bit different because uh, these, these plants um, for the fetal indication of uh, groundwater HCH contamination, we are using plants, actually trees, because they can reach uh, higher, higher depths. Uh, so principally, uh, the, the main principle for, for the HCH uptake is evapotranspiration. So on this figure, you can see, uh, you can see the difference between this tree which uh, roots doesn't reach HCH contaminated groundwater, whereas in the case of uh, the other tree, um, the roots are reaching uh, contaminated groundwater. And uh, why there are volatile organic compounds on this picture? It is because phytoscreening is a uh, well-established uh, technique of groundwater indication groundwater contamination uh, by volatile organic compounds. And uh, if uh, it is also valid or uh, applicable for HCH, it was uh, for us a question eight years ago. Now we already know that it is, it is doable and it is applicable. So uh, what is the main difference? So there are two, two approaches how to, how to survey uh, groundwater contamination. You can either use uh, uh, heavy machinery and drill some probes or you can use trees which can reach uh, and do the same job actually as the heavy machinery for you. But the condition is that the vegetation has to be present, actually the, the trees vegetation. So um, if there is no vegetation, then there is no phytoscreening, of course. <laughs> Okay, so uh, after this introduction, uh, 
let's have uh, some overview of, of my talk. So I will be speaking about uh, fetal screening history, about three uptake of HCH and its rules, about uh, check and polish sites, examples and data, about HCH azomer specific phytoaccumulation, about HCH distribution in three strands, about the differences in genotypes, uh, uptake of HCH, and about analytical approaches, and also about birch set monitoring results. So uh, let's start with phyto, phyto screening history. Uh, these are the fathers, uh, fathers who established uh, the, the topic or the research field. These uh, guys as Joel Birken, uh, Mr. Wrobleski, Mr. Sorek, and uh, Matt Limmer. Uh, they published over uh, 20 publications on phytoscreening of volatile organic compounds in trees and for using uh, this phytoscreening to indicate uh, contamination plume delineation. So uh, this is just some slide on, uh, on, the, on the ranking of the journals where, where they publish. So you can see that, uh, that most of the publications for PCE and TCE are in high, high quality, high ranking journals. And uh, typically they are comparing groundwater data and uh, trees data. So also this tree sampling, uh, also the term tree coring is used for, for that because uh, this increment bor borers, <laughs> which are just a manual device, how to, how to sample tree biomass are used. And uh, quite often the results, uh, there is a good match between groundwater data and uh, biomass data. So they conclude quite often that uh, tree biomass can be used as an indicator of volatile organic compounds. Uh, as for HCH in uh, trees biomass, there is not much literature and uh, the literature is not speaking about phytoscreening. They are speaking only about uh, bioaccumulation. So some, some of the studies uh, were done in Italy on uh, Jugland species and some of them in Germany on Prunus species. And also in Spain, uh, some of, some of uh, Spanish, Spanish guys uh, did, uh, did some bioaccumulation of HCH by, by shrubs, but uh, not by trees, uh, as far as I know. Okay, so uh, now I will, I will uh, switch to the, to the data from our two pilot sites, so from, uh, from Hayek and from Javorno. And I will talk about method verifications, about confirmation that HCH is present in the biomass, about uh, gradients that uh, are matching the, the biomass HCH content and about multi-species phytoscreening and uh, about the parameters that are responsible for various uh, uptake of HCH into the tree's biomass. And also, uh, I will say a few words about uh, lab experiments where we uh, are looking at the exposure of uh, young seedlings or germinating seeds uh, and the principles how they, how they uptake HCH. So um, those eight years ago, we developed a concept uh, of uh, really massive sampling campaigns uh, during which we can uh, go through the field and take hundreds and hundreds of samples using, uh, using cord cordless drills. Uh, to really uh, cover a big area that was the case of Yavosno site because uh, they really have suitable conditions, uh, nice vegetation. So um, we were using these disposable drills to, to grab uh, biomass samples. Also, you can use this incremental borer if you are uh, going to have a look into the dendrochronology. In this case, you have the core and you can decide which part of the core you will take for the extraction. If you are using just the drills, you have the mix, uniform mix, and you cannot do uh, any like uh, differentiation of the samples according to the age of the biomass. Uh, also, we uh, are using uh, beeswax mix to uh, 
to heal the wound after the drilling so that the tree is not suffering from, from the sampling, so it's not destructive for the trees, right? And uh, on this slide, I am uh, just showing you that uh, we can compare two different extraction methods. Uh, one of the methods is uh, solvent extraction. It is uh, on the x-axis. And the other is solid phase micro extraction on the epsilon axis. And you can see a very nice match on the real samples. So we just use the biomass of the tree and, uh, and compared uh, without very, some very specific homogenization. So uh, these are actually quite nice results, quite nice match uh, among the two, two different methods of extraction. And of course, after the extraction, we are using state-of-the-art uh, GC and tandem mass spectroscopic technique to determine the individual isomers of HCH. Uh, here are some, uh, some notes on the individual extraction techniques. Maybe I will skip, skip it because uh, there is not so much time to go into the details. But uh, what we can say that the solvent extraction is an exhaustive method and we can keep the samples almost forever. But in the case of solid phase micro extraction, this can be called like a green analytical techniques, technique. Uh, but uh, we have to perform the analysis um, the next day after, after we prepare the sample. So it's not very robust for the laboratory. Okay, so on Ostrovsky uh, Creek, which you already know from the previous presentations, we checked the gradient. Uh, so we know that inside the trees, uh, with the growing distance from the, from the spring, so with, uh, with uh, decreasing HCH concentration in the, in the uh, surface water, the, also the concentrations in the tree biomass go down, which is shown on, this, on these graphs. So actually the spring on these graphs is here and with the distance, the concentrations are dropping. Uh, now uh, this slide is showing results from Javorno. So you can see that uh, in 2017, we did uh, mapping using a mix of uh, three species. And also we took some duplicates of uh, different tree species which were growing very close together. And uh, we found out that uh, coniferous trees uptake much less than broadleaf trees. So in the next campaigns, we were sampling uh, just the birch trees because they, they, are, they have like, uh, they, are not, they have not very specific demands on the habitat, they grow everywhere. So, uh, they are actually the best species uh, because you can find them everywhere in the middle of Europe, maybe not in Spain. Um, okay, so the year after uh, we performed uh, even bigger sampling campaign with, uh, with uh, many more samples and uh, you can see the green points. They just indicate uh, concentrations uh, below the limit of quantitation. So you can see that actually the, only the Vavolnica River is uh, the, the vector which, uh, where HCH are spreading. So uh, the green points here indicate that uh, probably there is no spreading of HCH through groundwater and that the wells in, uh, in this residential area are not in danger. Okay, so uh, within Life of What project, we did another campaign, which confirmed uh, the previous results. What was additional was that also upstream from the, from the source zone, we can indicate some contamination of HCH. So probably the contamination in this area is, is uh, much more complex and there are more source zo zones as uh, was expected before. Okay, here are some other illustration figures how tree biomass uh, can be sampled. And uh, this slide illustrates the results 
of uh, various age and height, ACH concentration in the trees. So you can see that uh, with the height, the ACH concentration decrease as we would expect. And uh, also uh, the highest concentration we usually find in the central or the in other layer, not, uh, not in the layers, uh, not in the youngest parts of the tree. So, Uh, this, this, this data illustrate uh, the seasonality. So uh, trees are, trees are, uh, so HCH are not stable within the tree biomass. And uh, we can see that there are some minimum uh, concentrations during the winter season when, when there is no evapotranspiration and uh, no uptake of contaminated water. So the maximums of ACH in trees are present during spring and summer season. And again, you can see that with, with the high of the trees, the concentration decrease, right? Uh, this slide illustrates that uh, the rotten hardwood uh, doesn't, uh, since it is not uh, anymore uh, uh, there, there is no, no movement of the tree sap uh, to, the, to the higher parts of the tree. There are also no ACH present. And maybe there is also some degradation by the, by the fungi, which are usually present in this, in this uh, hardwood. Uh, whereas when the hardwood is healthy, there is usually a maximum. Okay, and now a few slides on... Uh, Okay, so a few slides on uh, seedlings exposure and uh, actually also the installation in the in the wetland is also a sort of sort of uh, seedlings exposure, uh, but we can also do seedlings exposure in the laboratory with uh, under under like uh, simplified conditions with pure chemicals to really test the behavior, the uptake and the distribution and uh, metabolites of ACH. So here are a few. Uh, slides illustrating that we are doing it, that we are distinguishing uh, various uh, genotypes of uh, alder tree, uh, as is this uh, illustrating this graph of my colleague uh, Stania Kuškova, Vrchovecka, and uh, also The main findings from the seedling exposure experiment were that uh, there is some trans isomerization happening. So if we enter the test with uh, pure delta isomer, we can later find also the other isomers inside the plant. So this is uh, something very important that this process happens. And uh, also we can observe uh, uniform uptake. So there are probably no differences on the root membrane uh, there, there is no differentiation between the individual isomers. Uh, this graph illustrates the usual, usual findings that most, the, the like big, biggest part of the ACH is, uh, as for the mass balance, is present in the roots of root part of the plant. So uh, in the above ground part is uh, the, the minority. And uh, last but not least, uh, we also performed some sampling of, of uh, birch tree sap. But the results uh, of, this, uh, of this sampling campaign uh, was not uh, really convincing so far. Uh, we, find, we found out that uh, the sensitivity of this approach is, uh, is very, very small. So we we are not resigning on that we will try hopefully this year in Javorno, uh, i think but uh, it's definitely better to sample sample the solid part of the trees uh, biomass and not the not the sap because hch uh, probably desorb from the sap into the into the wood and you you cannot almost find them in the, in, in the sap Okay, so also we are uh, with the utilization of uh, these high tech machines uh, looking for the metabolites, not just HCH and chlorobenzines and chlorophenols, but also 
conjugates, conjugates of these compounds with, uh, with glucose or, or malonate. And it was confirmed that these uh, metabolites are present. So uh, we are going to publish, publish these nice data um, in some scientific journal. And also we are uh, having a look at secondary metabolome. So at the metabolites, uh, which are like indicating the stress which the pollutant uh, initiates inside the plant, uh, such as uh, flavonoids and all these uh, phytohormones and, and secondary metabolites. Uh, to conclude, uh, definitely we can use trees to indicate groundwater ACH contamination. Um, we can, uh, it's better to use broadleaf trees if they are available. It's uh, possible to use solid phase micro extraction as a green analytical technique. Uh, we described quite nicely the distribution of ACH in Anus glutinosa trees uh, throughout the seasons, age, height. And uh, azimuthal phytoscreening did not so far bring uh, really interesting results did not bring a match with uh, uh, known gradients. And the uh, major part of ACH can be found in roots of the plants. And uh, yeah, as was, as was already told by Carlos, uh, tree presence leads to faster soil remediation from ACH load. And uh, birch sap is not a very sensitive matrix, so preferentially we should go for the solid part of the biomass. And with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, the projects and partners and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Pavel. You you have learned uh, how uh, we can uh, sample the contaminated uh, groundwater by much uh, simple and uh, not so expensive method compared to to drilling. So next talk uh, was prepared by uh, our colleague uh, Pavla Shvermova, but unfortunately she cannot be here. So that uh, it's a pity for you that instead of her, I will do the presentation. Uh, so the the the, the the talk was prepared by, by Pavla, she is on the picture, and her colleague Yitka, and uh, Paul Bardos, who is our colleague from, uh, from England. And uh, as I said, this is about, uh, about the survey of social uh, and economic uh, assessment. Uh, in the talk, uh, I will speak about the problem and how to solve it. The problem is some contaminated water. Uh, we go to sustainable remediation process and uh, we will compare our system wetland plus with the other technology like classical wastewater treatment plant and also no action and I can tell you now the, the results which uh, you will learn during the talk that the wetland shows uh, much better uh, performance from, from these three, three points of view. So what is the problem? The problem is that we have some contaminated water and we want to treat the water because we need the drinking water. Of course, the sources of drinking water are limited and we need to clean the water. And we can do it by different methods, by different scenarios, by, by different technologies. And we would like to select the best technology for our case. And this normally is based only on economic and ecology point of view, but also the social acceptance of the technology is also important. So that this is, this is based on the survey. Take all these three, not only money and the limits, but also the, the social ac acceptance of the method. And we call it uh, as a sustainable remediation process. So, uh, of course, the, every, every remediation we do or every treatment of water, uh, we do that the benefit of the treatment is bigger than uh, its impact. I know from my history some remediation where at the end the the benefit much but much was much lower compared to 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 money which we spent for remediation. Uh, so uh, as I said, uh, sustain the sustainable remediation is of course site and project specific. It means that one method which is selected for one site cannot be automatically applied to another site because the sites are different, conditions are different, and so on. 
the the technology which we use is based on the ISO method and applied in the Claire and Paul Bardos, who is so the co-author of this presentation, is co-author also of this, this method, which is based on balanced decision-making process. And as I said, we compare the technology from three points of view, three pillars, which is environment, society, and, and economic. Uh, the, altogether, it goes to 15 indicators categories, which are divided uh, to these three pillars. For example, if you look at the environment, this is the emission to air, soil and ground condition, groundwater and surface water, ecology and nature resources. The similarly, it's for the other two pillars. I will go later to it. And the whole process uh, in our case was uh, based on three steps. In the first steps, we make uh, the assessment in the very, very small core group of the project, which is the uh, principal investigator as a me, then the as, uh, expert for this assessment, which was the Paul Bardos, and expert for uh, water treatment technology, which was uh, for each side uh, one one person. In the second step, we extend the group to all shareholders, to beneficiaries of the of the project. So every every uh, partner was involved in this process, and in the last step, we also invited the stakeholder from outside, which is N N NGOs, uh, local authorities, water, water shell authorities, to, to, to do the assessment based on our previous assessment. And I show you that uh, the, the differences during these, these steps are not so big. So the methodology itself is that in these 15 categories, there is a 73 questions. We select the questions which are relevant to our case, and then we compare the technology as a at school, so we rank it from one, which is the best, to, to three, which is the worst. So the, uh, in the first step of assessment, we selected uh, 40, 45 uh, criteria, which are relevant for our case out of the 73. For example, acid rain uh, is not important, or effect from the dust, lo uh, light, uh, noise, and odor is during the construction is not relevant for the high excite because high excite is outside of villages outside of population so that for example these two questions but there is there is much more questions which are not relevant for the site and as i said we compare three technologies the first is our wetland system we use the classical wastewater treatment plant which is the of course alternative uh, solution and we also took no intervention no no change scenarios but we know that this is not acceptable for, for the site, but we took it as a, as a sort of base level for comparison. And uh, we got always such, such graphs. If, we, if you look at the, at the graph, this, is the, this, this graph shows uh, ranking of the, of the, of the technologies uh, by, based on the five, five categories I, I set, for example, emission to air, soil conditions, groundwater contamination, ecology, and natural resources. And the smallest area means better marking, better technology. So when there are three colors, the blue one is no change, no intervention. Then we have the red one, which is classical wastewater treatment plant, and the green one is the wetland. So that uh, if you look at uh, the wetland, the spot is smaller, so that the technology based on on the, these answers uh, is, is, the, is the best. And I have two pictures here. This is about the environment, both, but this is stage one, uh, which is constructed by this small team of, of three experts. And after uh, stage three, where the other uh, stakeholders are involved and also in these NGOs and, and local authorities, and these are involved. So if you look at these two pictures, they, they look differently, but in general, general, the results are the same. Even if there are some, some, some changes in ranking, the, the results are same. The, our technology is always somehow best in most of the criteria and the similar you will see for economics and social, social graphs. So it means that even if we take broader team, including the NGOs and these, the, they have the similar assessment, the similar, similar view of the technologies, like, like the core team of the experts who, who are involved in the, in the, in the remediation. 
If you look at the environmental crit criteria in the more details, uh, uh, we see that uh, the wetland plus is high rank, high rank it uh, scenarios. If you look at the, uh, for example, emission to air, uh, wetland plus generates some green greenhouses gases during the, the construction, of course. But the wastewater treatment plant do the same, but more over, it also needs some fossil carbon for the energy and for resources because it's chemical factory and it needs uh, for the operation, it needs energy and, and some resources. Uh, the groundwater and surface water, uh, both uh, technologies uh, uh, improve the quality of water, but uh, Wetland Plus uh, has some advantage because outflow water contains, contains the aquatic microflora flora, uh, and fauna, plankton, which, uh, uh, which uh, Martina was showing you. And of course, the classical wastewater treatment plant produces that water, which, uh, which has no biodiversity. If you look, for example, at natural resources, and waste, uh, classical wastewater treatment plant generate waste, which you need to treat, which you need to store somewhere. And uh, moreover, our technology use the local sources, wood chips for, for filling of the bio, bioabsorption units. This is, this, these are just some examples of the, of the technology. Again, the same graphs for economic uh, comparison. Again, you see that uh, the, there are some changes, not so big, uh, if, you, if you look at uh, stage one and stage three. If you summarize it, uh, Wetland Plus is cheaper compared to wastewater treatment plant, not, not, maybe not in the construction phase, but in operation phase, because, because uh, we need only monitoring and we need only uh, sometimes maintenance, but uh, treatment plants is chemical factory and needs everyday, everyday control and everyday action. On the other hand, uh, 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 wastewater treatment plant is, uh, is much, con much more control process compared to wastewater treatment. It's known, it's, it's well established and everybody knows how to do it, but it needs some money. Of course, no intervention, uh, so we know action is uh, the um, damaging reputation of the site owner because you postpone the solution for the future, so this is not acceptable solution and has the, the, the lowest score. Uh, the advantage of the wetland is also that there's a chance for replication. This is also the reason that we present we presented here because, uh, because we would like to replicate uh, the technology on, on other sites. There is also a creation of the local, local jobs in the wastewater treatment plant because, as I said, this is, this is the, the process which needs everyday maintenance, uh, which uh, Wetland Plus doesn't. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, Wetland Plus, uh, Plus is an opportunity to, to see the technology for school visits, education, and these, these purposes. If you look at the last, uh, last uh, criteria, which is social, Again, you see that uh, in, in both cases, stage one and stage three, the uh, wetland plus is the smallest spot, so that is best scoring. And if you look at detail, the, the ethics and quality, so of course no intervention is the, the problem postponed to, to ne next generation, which I already said. Uh, classical wastewater treatment plan as a chemical factory is risky for daily operation workers, so there can be some accidents, some 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 these problems uh, both technology improve the amenity of the river downstream uh, for the local community because uh, as i said in my first talk there is some fishing hunting some recreation areas so that of course the the improved uh, quality of water will will bring the benefits from from these actions uh, on the other hand, uh, well uh, established technology is wastewater treatment plant, which is uh, controlled, more straightforward, used, and uh, wetland is new technology which, which is not proven in big sites. We had before we started, we started uh, construct the full scale uh, operation in Hayek. We had there for three years running of small technology to, just to know the, the, the principles but still uh, to do something for 0.1 liter and for three liters per second is a different. And of course, uh, there are some, some unfortunate, uh, some, some uh, asynchronity, which uh, Jan showed that it needs some, some uh, changes during the tuning of the, of the process. 
So if I summarize here, uh, the wetland plus is uh, low, low emission of the gases. It increased the biodiversity, it's less expensive solution compared to treatment plant. It increased the land value and it has some education facility. The minus is, as is not proven technology. Uh, wastewater treatment plant create a job which can be important, especially for, for areas uh, where there are not so much uh, possibilities. This is a robust and standard uh, treatment. On the other hand, it produces waste, it uh, has higher operation cost, it also needs energy and, and water, which uh, sometimes is not available. Uh, it has some risks for workers and also risks some crime because it's just technology, somebody, somebody can come and try to steal something. Of course, no action has uh, no need for energy and uh, no produce CO2 and no produce waste. But as I said, uh, no ecological limits are fulfilled and problem is postponed for the next generation and also for the local people, uh, hunters and fishers. It's still still problem. So that's all about, about, the, about this part. And uh, thank you for your attention. And we move to the last uh, presentation, which will be by Antoine, Antoine here, about possible replication of our technology. Yeah. Yeah, my talk deals today with the protocol offered to the clients for wetland replication. That means what are the different steps to be achieved to validate that the treatment is feasible, to design the different compartments, and of course, what are the costs of the treatment? So you've seen this morning that Wetland Plus is an innovative, adaptable wetland treatment system for Lindane, but also we think because there is a lot of information concerning uh, uh, pesticide treatment by wetland. So we think this wetland can also treat uh, pesticide. To remove from different types of effluents, it can be groundwaters, residences, leakages, so on. And of course, it's a natural based solution to limit widespread of pesticide, but it's a pathway management. Yesterday morning, we saw a lot of presentation dealing with mega size problem. They have problem with denapol, they have problem with soil. So it's, there are huge problems. So this solution is for pathway management, just to protect uh, downstreams, um, the different targets from the contamination of lindane. So you've seen this scheme many times. This is a reactive zone description. So the first one is the sedimentary tank is, is partly an important one because this type of pollutants are, are hydrophobic. That means that they like suspended particle rather than water. So we think that a, a significant part of the contamination could be in this particle. So First, we need to sedimentate what can be sedimentated. Then we have an alternance um, of anaerobic reductive compartment composed both by a permeable reactive barrier filled with iron zero to create strong reducing condition, but also uh, a bioresorption system uh, to increase the residence time because we know that it's a key to, uh, to allow um, biodegradation in uh, this type of, um, of compartments to increase the residence time to let the bacteria work and treat the, uh, the, uh, the component. And finally, so this anaerobic treatment leads to compounds non-chlorinated because of reductive uh, processes. And then you create, We've, we've seen some, some results with, with Jan. You've seen some benzene, phenols, and, and other organic compounds that can be oxidable, and these compounds can be, can be uh, degraded in the aerobic wetland. So the main processes involved in uh, the, 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 the treatment are uh, uh, biodegradation, of course, thanks to bacteria that are located onto biofilms, and also within the roots of macrophyte that has been shown also by, by Carlos. And it is this redox variation, reductive and then oxidation that leads to first dechlorination and then oxidation of byproducts to lead to uh, totally degraded and, and, uh, and, and clean water. And as I said before, 
the bioabsorption system leads to optimized residence time. So we can put different types of organic matter, wood chips, peat, that will be tested at the Yarvogenal sites, um, and the, the reactive permeable uh, barrier uh, composed with iron filling to enhance these reductive conditions. Yeah? So to accelerate the treatment and maybe to reduce the global time residence in the wetland. So just before moving forward, I just need to present a, a little bit my company. I'm part of the surfing group and we have different type of uh, branches here, energy, water and so on. I work for the environmental remediation branch and we are based mainly in France, but also in Spain with the, the company Germbiant. I have my colleagues in the room to answer to any questions. Um, so we can make some work field in France or in Spain. It's just easy for us, but we can also do some lab tests and pilot tests abroad if it's necessary. So Sir Paul, I'm not going to bother you that much and not detail everything, but we have different trades, different business lines like soil and groundwater remediation and also effluent treatment, urban, industrial, landfill decade from domestic landfills, particularly. For instance, here you can see a wetland that has been developed to degrade uh, leakage from domestic landfill. So it's also an anaerobic compartment, then an aerobic compartment. Oh, it's the opposite, just to first oxidize, uh, oxidize uh, nitrogen and they uh, do the, the nitrification. Yeah. Uh, so Jerome Beyond also specialized in soil and groundwater remediation. I missed to mention also effluent treatment, brownfield restoration, and they are specialists in studying geology and hydrogeology. We have a, a laboratory and, and pilot. I'm in charge of uh, this, this part. So here you can also see uh, a pilot we have developed to go on the field to test wetland treatment solution. And we are able to, uh, to simulate different type of, of treatment, physical, chemical, and, uh, and so on. So what can we do for you? First one, what we called a desk study, that means with you, potential clients, we first sign an NDA, so we can exchange quite easily data. We propose you a free and confidential first study just to obtain a green light feasibility, thanks to all the, uh, the experts of life of what we have, and thanks to different feedbacks, literature, and what we learn from the pilots that are currently uh, ongoing. What type of data do we need? We need the context, the global context. What are the contaminants? What are the physical chemical parameters? What is the flow rate, of course, on the, of the impact difference? What is the surface topography? So we can uh, uh, already imagine how to implement this wetland. What is the surface available for treatment implementation? Do we need to have a, a strong VDVI um, uh, compartments or not? What is the outflow thresholds? What do we need to obtain in terms of abatement? If it concerns groundwater uh, problematics, we need a conceptual model just to uh, understand uh, what, is, what, is, what is happening on the site and how we can extract water then to, to treat it on the surface. But in any cases, if missing data uh, are identified, we can discuss about and, 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 and tell you how to obtain these ones to, to go further. If the green light is obtained, then we can propose you a lab test, so at around 10 to 20 kilo euros. The objective is, of course, to validate the feasibility and design the different compartments, uh, to validate the abatement or transformation kinetics, the residence time that is needed in each compartment, and to estimate, first estimate, of what is the capex and opex, what is the, the yeah, the installation cost and the operational costs. So first, when we receive this effluent, we can characterize it in terms of dissolved and suspended solid fraction of contaminants. As I told you, this type of contaminants are strongly bind to suspended particles. So you, we need to know what is the pool of contaminants 
uh, in the dissolved phase and in the suspended salt phase. What are the iron and manganese concentration? What is the granulometric analysis of these suspended particles? And what are the physical chemical parameters? Is the effluent already in reductive condition, as Hayek, for instance, or, or already in oxidative condition? Uh, then estimate what is the fraction that can be decantable to estimate what is the quantity of mood we can uh, obtain, um, estimate the cost and design the sedimentary tank if it's relevant. Then um, if there is still a, a suspended solid fraction that is non-decantable, the idea is also to test all the techniques that wetland to be as objective as possible. What are all the different techniques we can use? I mean, intensive techniques or extensive like wetland techniques to solve the problem. So we can make some coagulant flocculant test and membrane filtration tests very quick. And then we can operate wetland test and adsorption test on activated carbon. So just quickly, because this is kind of classical type of uh, experiments, uh, for the coagulation flocculation test, we test different type of coagulant, different concentration. Uh, we use flocculant if it's necessary. And then when we've selected the best reactive, we can estimate the dynamic sedimentation uh, um, velocity and then um, analyze the residual HCH uh, contamination, dissolved fraction, what are the mood quantity that have been decantated and what are the reactive concentrations. Concerning membrane filtration test, we had a very small device, it's really quick experiments. We have just a small piece of membrane uh, of ultrafiltration in that case. So we can then analyze the permeate analysis and see if, if it's uh, sufficient or not, or if we need to go further. Then classical friendly isotherms uh, to estimate what are the charge capacity of activated carbon depending on the thresholds we need to obtain. And finally, this wetland device. You can see here this device, we have already developed it um, in a, a former project for the treatment of domestic uh, um, landfills leakates. So the um, first one is an horizontal filter. So it's totally filled with, with water. And um, we had some um, wood chips to make the, the biosorption. So you can hear the wood chips that can be introduced. So the first one is anaerobic to make the reductive um, um, biodegradation processes. And then you have the aerobic um, wetland. So HCH and all the byproducts are monitored at each stage of the treatment, initial, after the horizontal filter, and finally, after the vertical filter. You can see that there is no reeds, no plants at all, because it's just a lab test. We've, we've seen that, um, that uh, the, um, the plant role uh, containing the abutment is really important. At lab scale, we cannot stimulate it. So we estimate, maybe we assume that the results can be underestimated, but maybe it's a, a, a caution that needs to be taken because during winter, we can imagine that biodegradation process, including plants process, could be weaker. So it can be maybe uh, good to have a, 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 a siding that is enough to treat water during all the, all the seasons. To initiate this type of experiments, we use urban sludge just to sow and initiate the, the growth of the biomass. Uh, as I told you, we, um, we use wood chips for the bioception. And uh, one thing that is important is that we made um, drilling in the, the horizontal and vertical compartment just to be sure that the results we obtain are not just the result of biosorption just to see what is the part of the contaminant has been sorbed from the part of the contaminant contamination that has been uh, uh, effectively degraded. So it's really important to have a real mass balance and uh, to confirm 
what the processes are involved in. And we, we already test this uh, lab pilot with, uh, with water, uh, with, um, with H8. I, I didn't plan to, to show you the results, but I, 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 can, I can send it to you if you're interested in it. But it works. And then to simulate what is the iron zero compartments, we have this type of, of column, this type of dynamic test. So we can fill this column with a mix of iron zero and gravel and sand. And uh, depending on the flow rate, we can estimate the transformation kinetics, what are the, the abatements thanks to iron zero, and to see what are the best options um, in mixing biosubstrate system and also iron zero system. So then, if it's uh, a green light obtained at lab scale, we have this pilot test I show you. The cost should be around 50, between 50 and 80,000 euros. Um, maybe if, if not necessary, if, if the context uh, allows us to be sure that from the lab test we can directly go to scale one, it, it can be possible. So you, um, you can see here also recent picture of the, this pilot. There is no risk because the picture are quite recent from this winter. And this type of pilots is as um, remote monitoring, so we can collect data at, at distance and control everything. And then the scale one of, the, of uh, Wetland Plus, we estimate maybe the cost between 300 and, and 500 kilo euros and a maximum of 20 cubic meter per hour or 5,000 square meter maximum. It's, it's part of our experience above this um, flow rate of this surface, we think that it, it rather um, be more interesting to have intensive treatment. So this, this type of treatment is more adaptable for flow less than 20 cubic per meter. To estimate the, the, what is the cost for the installation, it's directly linked to the basin surface that we need. What uh, volume should be excavated and what volume of fillings, iron zero, gravel, sand, wood chips are needed for the compartments. And of course, operational cost should be low due to, due to the rusticity of this passive treatment. Here you can see some of uh, uh, our realization to treat uh, urban uh, waste water treatment and also landfill leakage. And just to conclude my talk, uh, Miroslav, I, I just presented before that uh, for sure money is the key, but it's not the only um, part of the, let's say, the cake. Um, this type of treatment has also an, a, a lot of advantages um, in terms of economy, in terms of environmental. It increases biodiversity, uh, it is robust and adaptable. Uh, tolerates some flow variation, uh, low energy consumption, perfect landscape integration. So we have to consider all these parameters in the decision tool uh, before going further. So please, if you are interested to discuss more about this process, please come to uh, our stand. Uh, we are kind people. We are yeah, and disposed to discuss with you uh, about your project. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Antoine. This was a nice uh, final talk uh, when we offer you to cooperate with, the, with us or just come to us and discuss your problem. And we may, we may try to, 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 to help you or to, to find the solution together, which is also an important part of our project, as I said, uh, to make uh, other applications so that we would really like to, to, to get uh, and share our knowledge with you. Okay, so uh, we are here. If uh, somebody has uh, some question, you can ask even in, in, in uh, Spanish because we can either translate or we have the very good Spanish speaking man here. <laughs> Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting session. I'm t interested in the uh, chemical process of reduction uh, because uh, I'm trying to transform uh, the HCH uh, residues. Uh, by reduction using palladium and iron will be a much uh, 
uh, cheaper solution. I would like to know if, uh, if there any publication about the in-depth uh, um, mechanism of the reduction and uh, with the f uh, whole analysis of all the intermediates, uh, etc. Yeah. This, this, this issue was, was uh, already investigated some, some years ago and I can send you some reference to, uh, to, to some papers that is related to removal of ATH uh, with uh, Zoran Iron. Uh, and uh, uh, it is mostly focused on nanoscale zero bar and iron. But uh, we, due to financial or economic reasons, we focused on uh, macro uh, zero bar and iron. But doesn't matter, it is just the matter of kinetics. Uh, the chemical uh, background should be the same. So, yeah, we can, we can provide you with some references. Really nice, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and also the palladium can, can be there as a, as a catalyzer because, because for example, zero valent iron nanoparticles with uh, a little, a little uh, palladium on it, uh, they are much more reactive compared to, to normal particles. So that uh, in this case, of course, but uh, then it's much costly, especially nanoparticles are costly and uh, modification of palladium is even more costly so that uh, so we are closing the, the, the session. We will be we will be downstairs at our at our stand so that you can you can come later to it and just discuss with us. Thank you for coming. Thanks. <laughs>